Kickbox exists because I uh, was a serial entrepreneur. I ended up working at Adobe when they acquired my third startup. Uh, and I ended up inside the company and instead of operating the existing five product lines they purchased uh, with my startup, they asked me to go and create new products because that I'd had a track record across three startups and two decades of creating a lot of new sort of product categories and products. And they said, we have a lot of managers that can operate these existing products. That's, we're a big company, it's what we're good at. Um, but big companies are always challenged in identifying new disruptive innovations and you have a track record with many notable failures in between of, uh, but you know, a high hit rate of succeeding. So we would like to fund you to go and do what you do and have been doing um, now on behalf of us. And I thought that sounded like a really interesting challenge. And so uh, in a sense, kind of like an entrepreneur in residence sort of thing, they called me chief strategist. And because uh, a lot of it involves sort of strategy, innovation is ultimately strategy by other means. And the, uh, as I started doing it, the problem was I failed completely. So for the first time in my life, and I was hired to do this sort of undefined job, and I managed to fail at even the undefined job, and shipped for the first time in my entire adult life, I went two years and shipped nothing new. And yet for the first time, I had almost infinite resources, infinite support from an incredible organization, from the CEO down saying, do what you want, we support you 100%. And so I had resources, money, funding, people, a huge toy box of intellectual property and patents and everything. Uh, hundreds of PhD researchers, like an amazing amount of resources, when in my own startups I had no money, no funding, no time, in a garage or a bedroom and making new things. And suddenly I'm in the lap of luxury in, in essence and failed completely. So the patterns and things I did in the startup context and it was an ugly, abject failure. And it's kind of cool that Adobe just didn't fire me outright. They should have. And uh, because I, and I was like, I don't know why it isn't working. I'm trying, but it was creating political problems. So I was doing the things that had always worked for me when I was funding my own things or a venture capitalist was funding my things. And it wasn't working in the context of a large organization. And so I was planning to just quit Adobe and go back to doing my startups again as an entrepreneur. I said, well, I tried. I can't blame the company. It seems like a great company, but something's not working. And it would have been easy, I guess, to blame. Well, it's big companies. They just can't innovate. Um, but I decided to just get mad instead, and I blamed myself. I said, okay, the company is clearly successful, although like most large companies, they acquire existing products and the internally organically grown products is a minority usually. And so they acquire things after they're already successful and they are very good at scaling things beyond 1.0 and making them more efficient and better and taking them to new markets and doing those kind of things. Uh, and those are their core competencies. But it turns out starting at zero and getting to 1.0 is a completely different skill set. And not only different, it's actually opposite. And so a lot of the behaviors that work to do zero to one require doing the opposite thing of what actually works after 1.0. And in a large organization, and Adobe has incredibly healthy, good culture and environment, so there's, I couldn't blame the company because it's such a successful company and had been successful for so many decades at scaling things. So I said, all right, let's pretend the problem's entirely me. Even though I've done this successfully on my own before, I can't do it here. So I stopped trying to figure out how to do it because I started by asking everybody in the organization, how do you structure and do innovation? And the problem was I believed what they told me and I believed the org chart, but anybody that's been in a big company, which I hadn't, my largest startup that I started is about 250 people, $650 million valuation from my back bedroom to that, but that's the scale I had done. But Adobe is billions of dollars, 20,000 people and worth over hundred billion now. And so completely different context. And in that context, uh, the org chart doesn't really reflect how things work. <laughs> Silly me. And uh, having the complete support of the chairman, CEO, and top management doesn't mean that things will happen. And so I was starting at the top with full support, full budget and everything, and then things would end up blowing up on the way. And yet, as I looked for why did it blow up, I couldn't pin. There was nobody at any level that was doing the wrong thing within their context. 
And so at every localized context, everyone was doing the right thing because this large organism that very successfully services existing products and customers exists the way it is for a reason. And every innovator wants to change the company to fix it. And CEOs ask me all the time, how do I change my company to make it innovative? And it's like, well, if you're a successful company, chances are everything about the way your company operates, most things, operate the way they do for a good reason. It may no longer be clear what the reason is, but it evolved that way. And so wholesale changing things is almost always bad. Because I had the support to change things, and I tried changing things, and then there were unintended consequences and things blew up. And so what I found was, wait a minute, if I'm gonna innovate inside, the organization wants innovation, but everything that the organization is naturally doing that makes it successful suppresses this innovation and stops me. So I can say, stop stopping me, but then they stop doing the things they need to do to service the current customers and grow the business and be a predictable, quarterly, profitable company. So instead, I said, I'm gonna change what I do. We're gonna change nothing about the company, nothing about the way the company operates. And so when I started what eventually evolved to be the kickbox process, it was for myself to, this was how I hacked around the system to be successful. And I actually, because I had full support, <clears throat> I actually stopped changing anything, put things back the way they were, stopped telling anyone what I was doing, stopped, they were like, we wanna support you, what do we do? Nothing, I'm gonna do nothing for a while. And then I went very quietly and started working directly with customers and figuring out and having a data-driven process that was a very tight cycle that worked outside the normal approval processes. And it ended up being very effective and I managed to actually finally start shipping things and then ultimately do some really large acquisitions and other strategic changes for the company. Because innovation isn't always just making new organic projects, sometimes putting us in a new business. And I would be chartered with, go explore this area. I would find something and then I would start building a product and then I would realize, this is so good, we should probably acquire. And then I'd go identify who we should acquire and then turn over to m and who did all the hard work. But it's so sometimes the job of an innovator is actually not to make a new organic thing. And then sometimes we would innovate our own thing and uh, line up an acquisition. And if the acquisition didn't work, we would continue developing. And the day the acquisition closed, we shut down the internal project and then would apply what we had learned. So sometimes you work in parallel. And so that was the way innovation started working very successfully. And the long answer to your short question, where did Kickbox come from, was after that started working, and we had won Emmy Award for the first cloud service we had done that I sort of started despite the company not wanting to do it, um, and then ultimately used data to convince the company we should do it and got it to ship over resistance and concerns, then I was asked, teach other people how to do it inside Adobe. And that was where Kickbox came from. And initially I said, no, I don't know how to do that. Uh, I just know how to do it for me. And I finally figured this out and I'm kind of embarrassed it took me so long and I banged, and it's weird what I do, I don't even wanna talk about it, but it's working. And they're like, well, it is working, so teach other people. And they kept kind of pushing me, giving me warm encouragement to, to teach other people. And so I made Kickbox as actually, because I finally realized I don't know how to make a product, but I do know how to, uh, or I don't know how to make or teach people. I do know how to make a product. So if my customer is an, somebody who's an employee inside a large organization that has an idea or sees an opportunity, and they would like to test that out to see if they could be an innovator, but they're not even sure, it's not their job, but they would like to know if they could do this and if it could be successful, that's my customer. I'm gonna make a product to solve their problem, because that's who I was and I needed a product to solve that problem. So I took what I finally figured out worked and put that into Kickbox. But I didn't do it as a, like to run in, you know, I have never run innovation at Adobe, I, nor did I want to, and I turned down the job multiple times, and no one does. Um, the innovators run innovation at Adobe. Kickbox is a process, so really all it is is giving employees permission, giving them a clear process, and fundamentally getting out of their way. A lot of these sort of um, buzzwords or trends don't fit within Kickbox. Kickbox is a very simple process. It's very direct. And um, these are really broad, abstract trends that I don't find, I call them abstractions. So things like digitalization, artificial intelligence, cloud, uh, you know, the list, AR, VR, you know, all of that sort of thing. Um, none of those, and, and including blockchain, none of those are actually solutions for anybody. They are enabling, at best, they are enabling technologies 
And the question is, what do they enable for which customer and how valuable is it? Do they solve a problem that's hard and valuable for somebody? And if they don't, they're worthless. And if they do, then they're valuable, not because they are that thing, but for what they actually do. So I worry that we get seduced by abstractions that are meaningless. So I don't think anybody should print flags and rally behind them that is digital transformation or whatever. These are buzzwords that are completely abstract and fundamentally misdirection or at best they're just confusing. And so when you go and ask people that actually do stuff, employees that make things for customers uh, or get, you know, solve customer problems about any of these trends, they're like, oh, well, whatever, but what, what are we doing to solve this problem? And then if something that fits under that term or umbrella fits that, I guess that's a nice definition in a dictionary, but it, it's so abstract, I don't know how you make it actionable. It's a great question, and uh, the answer is you don't. Um, you keep the innovation completely separate, but interestingly, I like to, and what we did at Adobe is um, we have a bunch of different ways that we do innovation inside Adobe. We have for decades had our uh, research labs where we have postdoctoral researchers doing amazing things and collaborations with universities and publishing papers and doing deep theoretical research about inventing the future, like AI that we've been doing forever. And then we also have the product groups. They're working with customers, finding the next problem that are valuable for customers to solve. Then we have entrepreneurs and residents. Some cases, um, entrepreneurs we hire directly, other times they come with an acquisition. And we've always had those at Adobe. And they uh, work on coming up with new things. And we try to fund what they do. We have always done those things, and we still do those things. Kickbox is an extra layer that we put on top of that that is actually the cheapest thing we do, lowest cost lowest management overhead, so it's a rounding error against all these other things. So it's literally, don't even pay attention to it uh, because it's so cheap, so easy. But it's like this extra layer on top of it. And the way we describe it is it, it is the innovation process that we add to everything else that gives us innovation that we didn't know how to ask for. Because all the other things you're doing have this understanding that you're betting on a technology in the labs, you're betting on a customer problem with the, in the product groups, or you're betting on an EIR following like an industry trend. And, um, but that entails that you know what you're looking for. But as we all know, innovation comes often in the cracks between emerging changes. Particularly, disruptive innovation comes when there's a combination of a disruptive business model and a dis disruptive technology. But it's usually two things combining in unpredictable ways. And that's what disrupts incumbents and what companies should be paranoid about because they always get caught by surprise. From many computer companies to microcomputers, from data companies to, to you know, all of these stories, right? People missing the internet, people missing mobile. And so these, uh, how do you fund innovation to do things that you don't know how to predict? And the answer to that is um, try a lot of things very, very cheaply very cheaply so that you could try, like most even large companies size of Adobe might try a dozen or two dozen new things a year that they fund for a million, two million euros. Um, and, uh, and that was certainly the case at Adobe. But when we did start with Kickbox, the first year we tried in front of customers over a thousand new product ideas and we got two that work. So that's a 0.02% whatever hit rate, which is great. And so I often talk to CEOs and they're uh, at other companies and then I say, well, how many things are you doing? Oh, a dozen, two dozen, three dozen, you know, things we're trying. And I'm like, well, how many do you want to work? Three. And I'm like, so you have a hit rate of 20%, 25, uh, 10%? That's insane because nobody in the history of the universe, not the best venture capitalists, not the best startup entrepreneurs have gotten even one tenth of that. So why do you think you're magic that you can pick winners at that percentage? And if you actually are picking winners at that percentage, you're just playing games with the, they're not really innovative, right? They're just development. And so you can relabel your development as innovation to get that kind of hit rate, but you're just doing what I call innovation theater. You're pretending. And everybody will pretend with you because you're paying them, but you're not really doing innovation. I want to do real, I want to make stuff. I don't want to manage innovation. I want to make things. That's always been my, you know, so Kickbox is the way it is as a process because my deal with Adobe was I'll create a process that lets other people do it. As long as they don't need me to manage them, I don't have to run it. So I made it standalone, cheap, runs itself. And that's always been the case. So the entire kickbox process was never my full-time job at Adobe. 
And the neat thing is that Kickbox has been adopted now by thousands of other companies because it's free, open source. Um, and those companies have used it in many cases where the company didn't even know that employees were doing it. Employees downloaded it and did it. And that's actually was true at Adobe. Some of the first Kickbox projects that were successful were employees whose own management chain all the way up had no idea they were doing Kickbox. So not only does it not require the organization to change anything, it works better if the organization doesn't know. So Kickbox is better if it's just secret. And it's all on the innovator. The organization does nothing but provide a little bit of funding, a little bit of permission, and sort of look the other way. Interestingly, um, because it was something we made that we needed, um, I was asked to do it. Um, it was never thought of as a product. It was an internal thing. Teach other people how to do this, like our own execution ability. Like we knew we had to go through cultural change to shift to the cloud, to shift to AI. We had these fundamental shifts that we were looking at making. And we knew that it was the biggest change in the 30 year history of the company. And so to make that change, we knew we had to instill new culture, new processes and new ways of thinking. And that's why I got the request. Well, Mark's doing this weird stuff, seems to be working. Um, weirdly, don't know why, and not sure exactly what he's doing, but let's ask him to try to repeat, you know, get other people in the company to do it. And it started working very well, mostly because I didn't tell people what we were doing. And uh, it was just very quiet. Most of the company for the first two years we were doing it didn't know about it. It wasn't like a big announcement, a big initiative. The company was supportive, but it wasn't a big deal. It was just people were doing it and it was working. And so we weren't bragging, it's just like, well, teach some people to work out and diet and they lose weight. You don't have to make it a big initiative. And so the people were doing the work and we were being innovative. And then um, other companies started hearing about it in the Valley. And it was like, wait a minute, we heard you're doing this weird thing where you let anyone do any idea they want and you pre-fund them before they had the idea. And I'm like, yeah, that's what we do and it's working great. And we didn't make it weird on purpose. We tried everything else first and nothing else worked effectively. So people said, we'd like to know what you're doing while you share. And I'm like, sure, I guess. But then I started getting like 20, 30 calls a week from other companies. So in self-defense, I went to my boss and said, look, I want to work on my own projects and make new things. This is what I do. And uh, successfully or not sometimes. And I don't want to be going around teaching people about this. So can we just open source it? That was kind of my self-defensive maneuver. And my boss, you know, to his credit said, yeah, as long as you don't spend any money or take any time and it doesn't distract you. So Adobe's always had essentially a zero dollar budget to promote Kickbox. So everything that's happened, Kickbox now become the world's most used innovation process in enterprises, despite Adobe not doing anything to promote it and making zero dollars. So it was never my job to do it. I, spent $3,000 to make a website that was in my budget one year that I had extra money and we, the Kickbox site hasn't been changed in three years. Like nobody's edited it. Nobody, I mean, it's like we put zero effort. Nobody's assigned to it. Nobody, it's just to, hey, we give it away. People do what they want. And the neat thing is people have taken it, shared back. It's been localized in a bunch of languages. People like Swisscom, people like Cisco, people like MasterCard have done amazing things, which I've stolen back were great ideas. So there was like, you're doing what? You know, and people would come and share with me like, hey, we're doing this cool thing when they would contribute back because we say, hey, contribute back. And frankly, because it was not my job or no one's job, it took me a while. Though every like Christmas vacation, I would spend a day and integrate everything and put a new post online. Here's the new kickbox for the year with everybody's stuff because we didn't know it was nobody's job to do. But it was, has been successful enough that now we've you know, created this nonprofit foundation, not me, but other people um, at kickbox.org that will, um, you know, people can go and get information. There's a community driven process, which makes me incredibly happy. But Adobe gets nothing from it. So Adobe's been super cool at doing that and allowing me to just give it away. And, um, and, but it's really come down to the people that are making use of it and coming up with great ideas. And to me, probably the most exciting thing is the number of nonprofits from the United Nations to um, a lot of NGOs and nonprofits like Peace Corps using kickbox based process. Uh, and also now schools, universities teach it all over the place, like ETH now using it. Um, and so there's a bunch of schools using it. And then there's uh, now even high schools and like fourth graders. So I've actually seen like fourth graders doing kickbox based process. They're using it to teach STEM. And fourth graders are making new products for kindergartners as their customer and learning design thinking process around this open source process that's free. So that's incredibly gratifying and fun for me to see. So. Making it free turned out to be um, 
a uh, thing I did in self-defense to get my time back that ended up working out really well by accident. I'd like to claim credit for planning it all this way, but it just happened. It's, you know, it itself is a strategy to enable innovation, but it doesn't change our overall strategy. It's a way of implementing strategy. The interesting thing about driving an innovation process to the grassroots across a large organization is then a lot of people want to know what is the strategy? And in more detail, what is our strategy and what are we trying to pursue so that they know what to innovate? And that's actually ends up being a positive forcing function bottom up. So instead of the CEO standing up in front of the company and saying, here's our strategy, and here's why you should care, it's much better to have employees, hey, I got some thousand euros to try going a project, I'm going to spend a week doing it, I don't want to waste my time. And so uh, what, how do I align with our strategy? And then it's more pull instead of push, right, the messaging. And uh, so I think in that way it's beneficial to um, actually have people like, I'm trying to do stuff here, so tell me how it aligns. Uh, well, I'm retiring, uh, and so far, a couple months ago, I retired, and uh, as my wife told me the other day, I kind of suck at retirement so far. I'm not very good at it, and, uh, but like most things, I start off not very good at it, and then bang at it until I get better. And uh, so I've taken on way too much, and so we're kind of doing the Kickbox Foundation thing, which is really neat. And then I'm working on designing a degree program uh, with the University of California, which will be their first undergraduate degree. I've already been teaching for about 10 years in the graduate school of business management uh, for MBAs to learn entrepreneurship. But really, that's kind of like oil and water, like MBAs and entrepreneurship. So now we're creating an undergraduate program for younger students and get them before they've made the mistakes. And um, the neat thing is uh, I'm making it a minor degree because I think if you major in entrepreneurship, you drop out of school like I did. Like that's the, so now they have somebody who's a college dropout designing a degree program for the first time. And uh, but the neat thing, and University of California has been great, is they're gonna open source it and we're gonna make it free, which is kind of my condition for doing it. And so now any university in the world will be able to use it, ETH, I hope. And uh, it's kind of kickbox based, but it's also very different for undergraduates because they're not out in the real world yet. They don't understand real world problems yet. So designing a new kind of simulation context to help give them the experience to actually be an entrepreneur. Because their biggest questions, so I went out and interviewed my undergraduate customer, uh, their biggest things is, do I want to be an entrepreneur? Do I want to be an intrapreneur? What is that? And um, do I have what it takes? And when should I start? And how do I find a good idea? Like those are their very beginning questions. How do we answer those questions in a confident way instead of just teaching them about the theory of this? Uh, so I don't want to teach swimming in a classroom. You know, let's throw them in the pool. And so we've created this minor degree that we're going to start piloting in the fall, and I'm excited about that. I think it would be great if um, the people who are managing innovation in large corporations stop trying to manage innovation and just and realize that it's not inherently not manageable. And uh, so the best thing they can do to actually foster innovation is stop believing that they can manage it, and instead that it, innovation is a force of nature that's already in their people, and then the accidental nature of corporations is they suppress what the natural innovation that already would happen. So it's just stop stopping it <laughs> and give people permission, give them any process, kickbox or any other process that's very lightweight and easy, and then get out of the way. And uh, so permission, process, and get out of the way is really what they need to do. So that's uh, wish number one. And I think, uh, you know, for me, wish number two is I would like to, us to teach um, innovative thinking and creative thinking um, and design thinking principles in elementary school. Because I've seen these fourth grade students do amazing things. And now that I'm talking to high schools and universities, I'm asking them like, so the things you're teaching at the university level, fourth graders across town are already doing very competently. When they get to this university, what the hell are you going to teach them? Because they're already doing what you're currently teaching. So you're way out of step and you better start changing faster because the students that are coming in 10 years are gonna be much more advanced than your professors.